Good morning. Welcome to Church Online. Uh, we are thankful that God uh, still provides ways for us to gather together, either when we have to be separate. Uh, and uh, today we are taking precautions to in ensure the uh, health and well being of everybody involved. Uh, but uh, as we uh, talk a little bit today about Hebrews chapter 4, verses 1 to 10, we'll start with prayer and uh, continue to be in pray prayer uh, for everybody who's dealing with. Uh, health concerns and illnesses and difficulties during this time, and we pray for the uh, health care workers in hospitals uh, and nursing homes especially as they work through a lot of pressure right now. So let's be in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all that you do for us. Thank you for taking care of us and being with us. Uh, we pray right now especially for all those who are dealing with uh, health concerns and difficulties. Uh, we know the stress that that can add. We know the uh, struggle that that is. We pray for healing for individuals. We pray for healing for the masses, that you would bring this pandemic to an end, that you would uh, relieve the stresses and anxieties that are on us, and that we could uh, focus daily, regardless of our circumstances, more and more on your kingdom and on your will. We pray now that as we dig into your word, that uh, you would open it up to us, that we would be challenged and encouraged, and we would be united uh, across miles by your Holy Spirit's power. We pray that my words would be yours and you would bless us today. In your name we pray, amen. So as I said today, we're looking at uh, the beginning of Hebrews chapter 4. It's in many ways a continuation on where we were at last week. And last week we saw that warning that we need to persevere in our faith. See, perseverance, that's the true mark of a, a real believer. There's a lot of people who might run the race with us for a certain distance. They might be with us for a while, but eventually they're going to fall away. And Hebrews 3.14 said this, For we've come to share in Christ if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. See, if we are believers, if we have that share in Christ, then we will hold firm to the end. There are going to be bumps along the way. There are going to be difficulties. There are going to be moments of struggle and of failure. But if we're true believers, we come out the other side victorious. So Jesus used the parable of the sower to talk about the idea. The sower sowed seeds all over the place, and some of the seeds fell on things like stones or on paths, and there was nowhere for it to even begin growing. But there was other seed that got in certain levels of soil, and it even grew for a while. But then difficulties came. And it showed that there was nowhere for that plant to really root down into, and, and those plants passed away. It was only the seed that was in good soil that developed deep roots that established itself as a healthy plant. That's the only plant that persevered to the end. This showed that it was a true and good plant. So it's the results of the long run that show the faith that is set and real, not what we immediately see in the moment. And all this means that we don't need to worry whether or not we've lost our salvation because that's something, because of, if we, we don't need to worry if we lost our salvation because of something that's happened. That, that moment of salvation, that is a once-in-a-lifetime moment. That true commitment is set and it's firm and it's done and there's nothing that can take that away from us. When we make that commitment, when we make Jesus Christ our Lord. We are declared righteous in the eyes of God. Our sins, past, present, and future, are paid for by the blood of Jesus. We can't accidentally lose our salvation. We can't be tricked out of our salvation. We can't be forced out of our salvation. Our hope is sure. Our eternal destiny is assured. It's a done deal. But what is that eternal destiny? When we talk about salvation... And, and that e eternal kingdom, we know that we're talking about something that's coming down the line. And that's what this passage in Hebrews is explaining to us. This is our hope, what we're looking forward towards. The eternal destiny of the Father of Christ is to enter into his rest. That, that word rest is the key here. What does it mean? Well, it's the Greek word katapasis. And it means to put to rest, or more literally, a calming of the winds. And I really like that idea because sometimes we can often imagine uh, 
our life as this windstorm filled with the roar and the chaos, with stress and danger and things flying everywhere. But our hope is that we can look ahead to a time when the storm is calm. There's no more wind. There's no more turmoil. There's no more anxiety. It's just peace. And continuing on with the usage uh, of the Exodus to illustrate this point here, that the end, the arrest, uh, is our end goal that is equated to the Hebrew people entering into the promised land, into Canaan. That was supposed to be the end of their travels. They would return to the land their ancestors had left when Jacob had followed Joseph to Egypt and they had stayed there for 200 years. Even though they had been there that long, Egypt wasn't their home. Canaan was. And 200 years of exile, largely lived in slavery and oppression, finally came to an end so that they could have that rest. Except that it didn't work out the way they expected. Because after they made the 5,000 mile trek from Egypt to the Promised Land, and after they saw God's miracles and God's wrath along the way, and after they had been given God's law to guide them, after all the wonderful and amazing things that had happened, they got there and they said, uh-uh, no way. See, they thought they were just going to be handed everything. They thought, they thought they were going to walk into this pristine land with pre-built roads and cities and a wonderful climate and food everywhere. And all they had to do was each individually pick out which pristine hill with a beautiful vista they would live on. But see, God doesn't usually operate that way. They got to the promised land and they saw that it was indeed wonderful, though maybe not as magical as some had envisioned. But it was occupied. See, oddly enough, people didn't leave this beautiful area with lots of supplies that had been abandoned. They didn't leave it empty for 200 years. If, people wanted to, if the people wanted to be a nation, they were going to have to fight for their home. God made sure that the ending would be a foregone conclusion. They would win, and they would establish themselves, but they were going to have to work for it. Most of the people didn't like that. See, so they got the report back from 10 of the 12 spies that they had sent in there to scope things out. And they heard about the difficult situation they were going to have. And they decided, you know, this side of the river is really looking pretty good. We can just stay here. Sure, it's a little rocky and a little brown in the grass, but it's not that bad. Only two, Joshua and Caleb spoke up and said that if God told them that this was their land, that it was their land, and they needed to go and take it. But because the Hebrews rejected Joshua and Caleb, because they rejected the plans that God had given them, he didn't let their journey end there. He didn't let them rest. They had to wander for 40 years until the entirety of the generation that had rejected him at the border of the Promised Land was gone. Incidentally, that would have made Joshua, who led the conquest 40 years later that started at Jericho, it would have made him one of, if not the oldest man in the nation. Now our passage in Hebrews starts with this in chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us fear lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. For good news came to us just as to them. But the message they heard did not benefit them, because they were not united by faith with those who listened. For we who have believed enter that rest. As he has said, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest, although his works were finished from the foundation of the world. We're again here comparing ourselves to the Hebrews. Just like they got the good news that they could enter his rest by crossing into the promised land, we've been given a promise that we can enter into a new and better rest, an eternal rest. At the border, when all they had to do was cross over and get to work, the Hebrews rejected their rest, and in doing so, they rejected God. So God declared in his judgment that they wouldn't get to go. He knew they'd recognize their mistake later on, but it would be too late. All they could do is prepare their children, the next generation, 
to do what they should have done. Now, I think we've all stood at a similar border, faced with the decision to cross over and get to work, looking ahead at the promised rest, or to reject that offer and do things our own way. Because some that are watching this probably haven't crossed that border. They, there's probably many that, that see this that are, are just believing that because we go to church or because we do some good things or because we've said something, that we're bound to enter that rest. But just because we've said something or done something, it doesn't mean that we've truly made Jesus Christ our Lord. Going to church doesn't make you a believer. In fact, Jesus said there are many who will say, Lord, Lord, at judgment, and will still be found guilty because those people didn't live it, because it didn't go into their lives, because Jesus wasn't their Lord, something else was. See, true faith is a heart commitment that works itself out in a changed life, lived for the kingdom of God. And that commitment perseveres through the tough times and through the bumps in the road all the way to the end. Those who haven't made that commitment, who haven't given over everything to Jesus, they're the ones God is speaking about when he says here, they shall not enter my rest. That is a truly horrible, in fact, the most horrible thing we could possibly hear. But we don't have to hear it because we've all been offered that rest, the forgiveness of our sins, the purification of our lives and our hearts, and the eternity of rest and peace. It's all there for the taking, because Jesus made the way for us. Now it's interesting, here in verse 8, those of you who are reading along uh, that happened to be uh, using a, a they happen to be using a King James Version Bible, you're going to pick up on a pretty big discrepancy between your text and what uh, I read here from the ESV, uh, which is uh, more in line with most modern Bible translations. Verse eight: For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works, as God did from his. So what's the discrepancy for those who, who aren't following in the King James? The discrepancy is the beginning, the name, Joshua. That's what my Bible says, that's what most modern Bibles say. But the King James Version says Jesus, Jesus had given them rest. Now, it seems like a pretty big difference, right? Well, in, in actuality, this is one of the few places that the King James Version makes a translation error. Um, there aren't many of them. King James is, is an excellent translation for its day, but there's a couple, and this is one of them. Um, it seems like a big one, though, doesn't it? That Joshua, Jesus, how do you mix that up? Well, it's actually not that big of a mix-up, because Joshua is a Hebrew name. And if you translate the name Joshua from Hebrew into Greek, you know what you get? You can guess it. It's Jesus. It's the same name. It's two different languages. The fact that Jesus and Joshua being the same name, that's not a coincidence because just like Joshua, 40 years after his fellow Hebrews rejected God, led the next generation into the promised land, led them into the rest from their wandering. Jesus is the new and better Joshua that will lead us into an eternal rest, that will end our struggle and our battles and will work and end the work that made this life so difficult and made this life so painful. And we start that journey, we start that work now. Like the Hebrews, it's going to take effort to get to the end. It's not just going to be handed to us and we just get to kick back and relax. But it's going to be so worth it. Right now, we need to commit to doing whatever it takes to follow Jesus. We need to commit our minds our hearts and our lives to him, and work to that end, knowing that the reward for our perseverance will be glorious. That's what's promised to us. Thank you for joining us this morning. Let me pray for you, and uh, hope you have a great week. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your message. We thank you for the promised rest that you've given to us that we look forward to in the end. I pray that you would bless us as we go through the week. Keep us safe, keep us healthy energize us 
towards your work, towards your mission, towards your glory. In all things, we pray that you would be central in our lives. Be with us and bless us. In your name we pray. Amen. God bless.